I am super excited about my guest today, Dr. Lauren Tessier, because she specializes in mold. And I think that this is really an underrecognized cause of headaches in conventional medicine. It's not something we test for, it's not something we treat, but it is something that is contributing to headaches for an awful lot of people. So super excited to be able to share this information with you. And I find that so many people don't know if they have been exposed to mold or not. So I am a perfect example. I did a, a small kitchen remodel, just replaced a countertop mm -hmm. uh, two years ago. And when they took out the counter, they saw mold behind the kitchen sink. There had not been um, a backsplash when I first moved into the house, I was all excited. I was going to make my own backsplash. Well, I had three kids at the time. The backsplash <laughs> never happened. And so <laughs> what happened instead was water dripped down behind my countertop and there was mold all along the wallboard um, behind my kitchen sink. I never would have known, never would have had a clue. It's behind the, you know, the back wall of the kitchen cabinet. So there was no way to see it. So I feel like there's so many people out there who may have mold exposure and they don't even know. And so if somebody is having headaches, are there any clues that they can use based on their symptoms to figure out if they should go get tested for mold? And for me, clinically speaking, the most common symptom is the brain fog and fatigue. Um, and the, the headaches get rolled into there and the headaches can either be like a sinus pressure headache or a tension headache or a migraineous headache. They kind of pop up in a lot of odd ways, but really the, the big cornerstones are, um, the, the brain fog and the fatigue. Um, and brain fog is such an unfortunate, such an unfortunate term for all the different things that we can see for people. Um, I've seen everything from difficulty with word recall, um, word finding, uh, short-term memory, um, sometimes even a little bit of like depersonalization, derealization, where someone feels like they're kind of um, out of touch, out of tune with how they normally move through life. And I do want to point out that people with chronic headaches who are having headaches almost every day or every day are definitely going to have some element of brain fog and fatigue, especially if you're not sleeping at night, if your headaches are keeping you up or if you can't sleep and that's what causes your headaches. Either way, um, there can certainly be that element of it, but I think it's a matter of degree, right? Mm -hmm. So like if your headaches are here and your cognition is kind of here in terms of what's bothering you, that may not be as suggestive as if your headaches are here and your cognition is here in terms right. of what's bothering you, like they're both bothering you a lot. It sounds like that may be a symptom that you really shouldn't blow off. You need to pay attention to that and go in and get checked out. Am I hearing you right? Yes, absolutely. And one of the things that you just triggered for me to, to recall and share is that there can be a, um, a periosity in the timing. And so if you're someone where let's say so for example, 85% of commercial buildings in the United States have either a current or past history, a current or past water damage issue, 85%. And so what you'll end up seeing is that someone will come home on Friday, be really just like knocked down, dragged out, go to bed Saturday. They do their stuff around the house. By Sunday night, they're feeling clear headed. They're feeling great. They get back to work. 9 a.m. on Monday, by noontime, they are back in the pits again. All right. So let's say that, you know, um, you have noticed this, you know, disproportionate amount of brain fog and fatigue. You have noticed maybe that there are places where it seems to get worse. You decide you want to go get checked out. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, you need to find a good provider. But then what kind of tests might that person be running or what are your favorites? <laughs> If there's really <clears throat> one type of test that I use the most in my practice, it is the urine, um, urinary mycotoxin testing. And that's because it lets us understand if there is a body burden of urine mycotoxins. We can't tell where they came from. We can't actually tell how much is in the body, but we can use it as a screening to say, hey, this stuff's coming out of your body. Let's track it. Let's treat it. 
and let's watch and make sure that the numbers go down and correlate with an improvement in your symptoms. Gotcha. Gotcha. Okay. So then a urine mycotoxin test might be something that people would be looking at. So I'm just curious, tell me what you think the pros and cons are of something like dust testing. You can get those kits anywhere. They're pretty cheap. Um, tell me your perspective on those. There's, there's a few aspects to it. It depends on what type of lab processing that they're using. Some labs will only use microscopy where they'll take whatever they catch on the dust they'll put it under a microscope they'll look at it and they go okay that looks a lot like aspergillus and penicillium and so a lot of people who do um, home testing they'll get their testing back and they'll say you know 3,000 spores for asp pen aspergillus and penicillium well those two geniuses are huge they're huge and a lot of them are non-toxic, but there's some really big toxic ones in there, like Aspergillus fumigatus, Aspergillus niger, in that group that can be tucked in there. So you might have a 3,000 spore count, but you don't know if it's a toxic one or maybe a little bit more of an allergenic one. And so there's certain limits to dust testing. There's another type of dust testing that uses a technology called MSQ-PCR. And the most common test that they have is called an ERMI, E-R-M-I. And the ERMI has some limitations because it only tests for the 37 most common molds in an environment. And the limitation there is, well, if they're not testing for it and you catch something that is not part of the test, it won't come back positive. So let's say this person who is having headaches, lots of brain fog, lots of fatigue, goes and gets a urine mycotoxin test, something shows up, they do a dust test on their house or they have an IEP come in, they do have some concerning types of mold in their house. Can you just give me kind of a bird's eye view of what treatment might look like? So the cornerstone to treatment, and this is this can, this is the hardest part is avoidance is avoidance. Um, and that could be temporary avoidance. That could be leaving and staying in a different space for a period of time. Um, it could be remediating the place fully so that way you can live in it safely. So essentially getting out of the mold that you were exposed to when you became sick, um, that will always be the cornerstone for treatment. Um, Usually I do a pre-detox with people where I prepare them to do a detox push with a lot of heavy duty antioxidants and glutathione and NAC, but a lot of people can't have that um, liberation <clears throat> of those things from storage into their system. And so I do a lot of pre-detox work so that way people can then move into that part where we are actively detoxing them, we're pushing on those detox pathways. Got it. Okay. So it ends up being supplements, gut health, those sorts of things that help people. Um, I guess you're really helping your own body clear the exactly. uh, effects of the mycotoxins, right? Yeah. And very rarely I'll use an antifungal, but we have such a growing issue with antifungal resistance. Um, and I find that you don't need antifungals as often as some people do. I usually find that people's toxic burden is coming from their environment rather than like a sinus colonization. Mm -hmm. um, but probably, you know, a handful of cases do really well with an antifungal. Like, so thank you so much for sharing your expertise here today. Oh, thank you for having me. It's been a pleasure. Take care. Mm -hmm.